Well, today we are going to uh, be looking at the topic, Get Power from the Holy Spirit. Jesus, at the uh, end of Luke, gave his uh, disciples a task which is still undone. So we are charged with this task along with the original apostles. And uh, Jesus said that the way to accomplish it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will give you power and without the power of the Holy Spirit you won't be able to accomplish the task. Uh, the task was to let everybody know that repentance and forgiveness of sins was to be proclaimed to all the nations. So repentance and forgiveness of sins to all the nations, Iran, Iraq, North and South Korea, places that want to hear it, places that don't. Uh, America in all, in, in the positions of power as well as uh, places where there's no power at all. Everywhere in all the nations, repentance, meaning turning around, changing your mind, doing something different, and forgiveness of sins. So what, how, how deep does that forgiveness of sins go? We're going to look at a number of examples from the Bible starting in Luke 17. Jesus, when he's talking to the uh, disciples about how often you forgive someone, says, when you're thinking about sin, be on your guard. Be on your guard, and if another disciple sins, if someone else in this church or so, an, a Christian from your workplace, or if some disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. Uh, that's something that... That's something that has become a specialized industry. There are one or two people who've taken over rebuking for all the rest of us. Right? They, they, they're good at rebuking, but the rest of us not so much. The rest of us are just quiet. Let things slide. Don't want to ruffle the water. A person is sitting on a hot stove. The gas is on, or the element is being heated, but we don't want to say anything. They might not like to hear the news, but that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, if another disciple sins, you've got to talk to him, call him out. Tell him this isn't right. You still love them, and you let them decide what to do. You don't take away their freedom of choice, but you do call them out. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And then, if there's repentance, you must forgive. Now, repentance is turning around, changing your mind, doing something different. It's not remorse. So there are a lot of people who, when they are confronted and told, you're going to lose your position of employment because you've been doing this thing which we cannot tolerate. They are sorry they're losing their paycheck, remorseful about that, and that's the sorrow that they express. Oh, you can't do this to me, I'm supporting all these people, or whatever their excuse is, but that's not repentance. Repentance is sorrow over the deed and changing your intention of how you will live. It's not sorrow over consequences. There are plenty of people in prison who are remorseful, but not repentant. And it's not limited to prison. It's in prisons of all kinds. People who are free out in society, but in, a, in, in chains, in a prison of the, their thoughts and the way that they are acting. But Jesus says, if there's repentance, you must forgive if the same person sins against you seven times a day. You've got to forgive them seven times a day. Now, there, there are people who are just caught in something. They're, they're trying to escape, but they don't know how. They don't have the skills yet, perhaps. Forgive them. And luckily for you and for me, there's no limit to this. Seven times a day, whatever, however, offer, however often it is, forgiveness from God is without limit. Anytime you need it, Anytime you express that you are repentant and sorrowful, you receive forgiveness. Forgiveness is without limit. Jesus, when he was crucified on the cross, was crucified between two criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And one of the criminals is harassing Jesus, saying the same things, that the same charges against Jesus that the people down uh, standing around in power are hurling at Jesus, saying, 
yeah, you're not such a great king anymore, are you? Dying on the cross. And so one of the uh, people crucified with Jesus is hurling these insults at him. And the other person on the other side says, stop saying those kinds of things. This man is innocent. You and I, we, we deserve what we're getting, but this man is innocent. He turns to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, there's a couple of things going on. One is that he is able to look at Jesus on the cross bleeding to death and, and losing consciousness from, from asphyxiation. He's able to see in the body that's been flogged and beat up by the Romans. He's able to see the Messiah coming into his kingdom. There are plenty of people who can look at Jesus breaking the five loaves and the two fish and handing it out and distributing it enough for all. And in the miracles, they're not able to see Jesus. But here, someone is able to see Jesus as he is, dying for our sins on the cross and to recognize that this is the Messiah. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looks at him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. So the kind of forgiveness that God is talking about, that, we, that Jesus is talking about, that we're to be proclaiming to all the nations, is an unconditional forgiveness. The thief on the cross who was dying beside him did not have anything to offer. He was dying too. He could say he was sorry for his sins, but he had no chance to turn around and amend his life. His life was over. Today, Jesus says he'll be with me in paradise. That, uh, forgiveness that Jesus and God offers is without limit, without constraint. So you can have consequences. You might lose your job. You might lose the um, good name that you have. You might lose the favor of your family or people around you. But from God, God forgives you. <laughs> forgiveness without limit. Jesus told a story in Luke 7. There's a certain creditor who had two debtors. And for this, uh, to help you figure out uh, what it is equivalent to, the first debtor owned 50 days wages. So do you take Sundays off? Some of you take Saturdays and Sundays off. Let's call it two months on average. So what's your one monthly wage? And double that. So I need you to think of your monthly wage, whatever it is. Some of you think, I don't earn anything. Well, you're getting income some way whether it's from um, the generosity of the U.S. government or your spouse or what, what's your monthly income and double that. So you, everybody got a figure in mind? All right, that's what, the first credit, that's what the first debtor owed. And the second debtor owed 10 times that amount. So you've got the first amount and the second amount. Now some of you are thinking, yeah, I could pay off that second amount. But it's not especially realistic for most of us. There's a certain tipping point where if you've gotten uh, so much debt with the interest on it that you do not have enough capital to pay down the debt because the interest gets, accumulates faster than you're able to pay it down. That's the status of this person. Might be the status of some governments you can name. Jesus says they were both forgiven. This is not a story about how government should operate. This is a story about God's grace and mercy and forgiveness for individuals. God's mercy is radical. It's without limit, without constraint. That's the message that Jesus want proclaimed to all the nations. There are plenty of people here in San Diego who do not know that their lifetime Maybe a, a lifetime like the thief dying next to Jesus, criminal dying next to Jesus, can be forgiven. Some people have only one thing that they want forgiveness for. Some people need forgiveness for an entire lifetime. God is eager to forgive all without limit. Jesus says, repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed to all the nations. So stay here until you've been clothed with power from on high. The way to do it is through love and, and the power from the Holy Spirit. 
you can do some things on your own. There's a pastor named Randy who is in the Midwest who was pastoring a church as best he could and his own marriage was in trouble. He was managing it as best he could. The church was an average church, but it, they, they believed the Bible. They just didn't see the Bible. They believed that the power of God was present for healing, but when they prayed, they didn't see much evidence of it. And Randy was uh, a little bit, um, he was at his wit's end. And uh, as he's uh, praying, interceding, wondering if he should just give, give up completely, uh, he feels impressed by God to go to the one place that he doesn't want to go. Now that'll be the case for a lot of people. They're in a situation, they don't like what the condition they're in, but they're not willing to change to get a different result. You're going to stay the same unless you change. Uh, Randy, the evangelist that he was impressed to go see, the evangelist had a terrible theology from Randy's point of view. And if you study the history of God moving through the last 2,000 years, every time there was a really amazing outbreak of power setting up people for a cultural shift that would change the world, either in their neighborhood or the whole world, uh, in those times, the people who brought that power, their theology all across the map. God doesn't seem to care about people's theology in terms of who God favors with power. Uh, Randy didn't like this particular evangel evangelist denomination or the way that he taught, but he was desperate. When you're desperate, you face a choice. Yeah, I don't know, can I see the hands of people who, you know what a hand pump is, a well, and the well comes out of the ground through a hand pump? Oh good, we're all old enough. <laughs> so with a hand pump, the way it works is that it has to be primed. If someone takes the last drop of water, you might not get any more water out of that well because you, ha you have to prime the pump to get more water out. So as you're getting water, the last thing you need to do is leave a little bit of water so that the pump can get more water out. Sometimes someone, grandkid, comes along, doesn't know that, and leaves it with no, and then you have to get water. Because you're not gonna get water if your pump's not primed. If you're on a quest to get water, and you go to Niagara Falls, you might think, God, this is a little unnecessary. I just need a cup. That, that, that's, that's all I need. I have no idea what to do with this much water. That's a little bit what a revival's like. You're just not, I mean, it, you're pretty sure that if you stick your cup out there, the falls might, might steal your cup from you with the force that it's coming down. But if you need to prime your pump, it's got to be primed some way or another. Randy decided to check it out. And when you're impressed by God to do something, that's really the only way you can test whether it's God or not. Now I say that because I'm assuming that you make the initial screens. The initial screens are first, is it sin? If it's sin, it's not God telling you to do it. Say, oh, I just felt God telling me to do something that God's Word clearly prevents. That's not God. Might be you, might be your neighbors, might be temptation, but it's definitely not God. So you can eliminate sin, and you can also eliminate things that come to you with a, a sense, a spirit, that's not the kind of spirit that God has. So, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, those are the kinds of things that you should expect to be feeling as you get an inspiration from God. So if you get an inspiration to do something and you're feeling anxious or pressed to do it, that's not God. God's Spirit will bring peace. God's Spirit will fill you with love and joy. 
So as you're evaluating impressions that you have, if you've got an impression but it, it just it, it feels anxious or something about it doesn't feel right, you should put that on the shelf. Ignore it. It may be an idea from God that you're rushing, that the time isn't yet. Or it easily could be an idea that looks good, sounds good, but is not from God because God knows the full... We have a small view of our universe and God's able to see the whole thing, including what's around the corners for us, what's coming up in time and history, uh, time and space. And God's able to uh, help us with a lot of information that we have not do not have, do not have available to us. So as you're testing impressions, is it sin? You reject all that. What is my sense about it? Do, is, my sen is my spirit at peace? Then it's a good idea to test out those ideas. Randy did, he went to this particular evangelist and if you're at Niagara Falls to get some water, you may as well get as wet as you can. It's possible to stay way in the back and just get a little bit of spray. It's possible to get on the boat and just get a little bit of spray. Now, for those of you who have been on the boat, you're saying, that was not a little bit of spray. I was drenched. Okay, you were drenched, but did you get in the water? No, it's too cold. It's too powerful. It's too forceful. That's how people deal with a revival a lot of times. Oh, uh, a little bit of spray, that's good enough for me. A little bit of spray is good enough if you're at the base of Niagara Falls and you have a little bit of spray all the time. But if you're going to Niagara Falls to get some water to go home and it's your last shot, you may as well get as big a bucket as you got. If this prompts people to actually not realize I'm speaking in a metaphor, and in Canada, if there are people who show up with big buckets, I'm sorry. When you have an impression from God, you check it out and see if it's true or not. Randy went to this evangelist. The evangelist, I've gone to a number of his meetings, and he spends the first hour or hour and a half or two hours trying to get anybody who is um, angry, resentful, or judgmental out of the meeting. So he'll tell jokes and be offensive and do all kinds of things so that if there's somebody there with a judgmental, critical spirit, they'll leave in disgust. And I'm not recommending that as a preaching strategy, I'm just saying that's the way it is for this guy. And eventually he'll get to where he'll pray for everybody. And in some, uh, if you watch Christian television, you know that sometimes a person can uh, put their hand out and the person they're praying for will fall over without being touched. Sometimes happens. And it sometimes happens for this particular evangelist, but he's also, he's not going to let you stay standing. So if you don't fall over when he's six inches, uh, three feet away or six inches away, he's going to push you over. It's just the way it is. And there are plenty of debates about, oh, that's just not right. God flows with power through a remarkably diverse set of people. So Randy was there to receive as much as he could, not just a little misting, as much as he could. So he got in line once. When he got prayed for, he got back in line again took off his glasses, got in line, received prayer a second time. I don't know if he must up his hair, put on a hat, whatever. He got in line a third time, then a fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. He's there not to get this person's theology. He's there not to get his preaching style. He's there to get the pump primed. And if in this place your pump, is, your pump is primed, you don't probably need to go anywhere. But if your pump isn't, is, if your pump's not primed, you should go somewhere you can get the living water to get your pump primed. So you can get pump water all the time. But it takes something to get it started. 
And if it's flowing right now, you're in a good spot. If your pump's not flowing right now, you need to get it primed. And if this isn't the place that'll do it, I encourage you to go to a place where you just don't like their theology and their style of worship's horrible. They sing and they dance and they wave their hands and they do all kinds of things you do not want to do. But what you want is the Holy Spirit. In Acts, the Holy Spirit came to people at a wide variety of times. Before baptism, sometimes people believed in Jesus, were baptized, and didn't receive the Holy Spirit in fullness. Someone came along and said, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, I, no. So the Peter and John, other apostles, touched them with their hands, prayed for them, and they received the Holy Spirit. There's lots of different ways that people receive the Holy Spirit, but it is not by a set way that happens the same time every time. God's not big on being constrained by formulas. Some people don't want power. What they want is certainty. You're not going to get certainty from on high. Some people don't want certainty. What they want is clarity. You can get clarity up to a point, but you're never going to get the spot where you can abandon God because you're so sure of it. So sure of what the truth is. If you're at that spot, you're probably a Pharisee. That's a dangerous spot when you think you've got that much clarity. You're probably also not going to get confidence. There, uh, there's a, a teacher here in Southern California who's taught in uh, huge stadiums coming to uh, teach people how to receive Jesus as Lord. And he's done tens of thousands of people one-on-one -on -one counseling them how to receive Christ. He says, it's never any easier. If what you're waiting for is, to, is the confidence that it's a, you're not going to get that confidence. It's always stepping out in faith. And some people want sinlessness. If you want sinlessness, you want Jesus. But you're never going to get to a sinless state where you can be so pure and holy that you can go out and finally do God's work. God's work is accomplished by people who need Jesus, not by people who are Jesus. Did you catch that? You are never going to get to a spot that's so sinless that you can do the work that God assigned you to do. Your sinlessness comes from Jesus. You are clothed with the righteousness of Christ, not of you. So uh, your sin will disqualify you all the time if you let it. But it shouldn't. Your sin is covered by God, by Jesus. He died on the cross for you. What you receive is power, not the sense of power. When Jesus' disciples had five loaves and two fish, it didn't look like much to them. But Jesus broke it. And there are some people who would like to have the sense of power. So what they want is the bakery trucks to drive up full of bread. But God doesn't give you bakery trucks full of bread much of the time. God gives you five loaves and two fish that with the power of the Holy Spirit will be enough for the need as you keep giving it away. And you think, this is not enough, this is not enough, this is not enough, this is not going anywhere. No one will be able to be fed, and 5,000 people are fed out of the thing. Stay here until you have been clothed with power from on high. So the power from, from God comes from the Holy Spirit. When should you receive the Holy Spirit? Before you need it. You do not want to be a soldier in an army thinking, eh, I, I'm going to do calisthenics and, and uh, I'm going to do my weight training and, and get, you know, running. I'm going to do all that fitness stuff when the enemy attacks, when I need it. No, you become strong before so that when you need to be strong, you are. Although there are plenty of people who are waiting for the day that they really need the Holy Spirit before they decide they want power. 
which is kind of, I, I mean, some people, it will work out okay because God loves them, but it's a terrible strategy because you're missing out on the years of training and lots of things that will be helpful along the way. If we were in a Baptist church, this message would be another 40 minutes. Or Assembly of God. Lots of. If we were 100 years ago, and I quit now, I'd be fired because the message is, or 200 years ago, because the message needed to be two hours long. Some of you are thinking, you're not saying that we'll do that, right? We're going to stop right here. Uh, but at the service today, uh, at various spots, is, there's an opportunity for you to ask for more of God's Spirit. I would encourage you to do it before you need it. Before you meet the cancer patient who is in stage four and you need to heal them. Before you are sitting face to face with someone, this is their only opportunity to hear about Jesus. And if you blow it, they're going to make a decision that takes them on a trajectory that's uh, dangerous and eternal. You, you want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life at all times, not just after the fact when you need it. So we're going to have a chance to pray uh, throughout the service and at the end of the service if you want to stay after. Um, we'll have a chance for me to uh, put my hands on you and to pray for you. We're going to take some time now for prayer. Why don't you stand? God, there's people uh, listening to this message who, uh, for them, the time's right now, they don't want to wait. So, so we ask now that for anyone who's asking for more of your spirit, that you, we thank you for your amazing mercy and your love for them and your promise that all we have to do is ask. So thank you for freeing people from the need for certainty for freeing people from the need for uh, the sense of power, for freeing people from the need for clarity, and for helping them to recognize in your promise your faithfulness. Thank you for pouring out your spirit, God. We praise you. Amen.